Lord God, we thank you that you are here with us, that you never leave us or forsake us. And we pray that as your word comes to us this morning through your servant Chris, that we will hear it and that we will absorb it into our lives and that it will make us do your will. Mm. Help us, Lord, to put our lives in your hands and to serve you with everything that we do. And we pray for Chris that you will work with your Holy Spirit to bring us your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks. Now, as the book of Jonah comes to a close, it's good for us to be reminded of the lessons that Jonah has taught us so far. Now, the book of Jonah has really been exploring the heart of the prophet Jonah. And as we have seen, it's really not about the great fish at all. We've seen that Jonah was this obstinate, stubborn prophet who ran away from God. That he didn't want to be the instrument of God's grace to the people of Nineveh. He could not accept God's grace to these evil and wicked people. And we learn in chapter 1 that Jonah's heart was hard and harsh and bitter. We saw that in Jonah's heart, he, he thought that God's grace was too small for, people, uh, for the people of Nineveh. And yet God did not abandon Jonah. He was not done with Jonah yet. And uh, he was about to teach Jonah that his grace was far bigger than Jonah was willing to admit. And so God's method of dealing with Jonah's heart was to slowly but surely expose Jonah's heart. He was bringing to the forefront Jonah's pride and his pig-headedness. And he was peeling away, if you like, the layers of an onion of Jonah's onion heart. And as Jonah's heart is exposed, he starts changing. And the first lesson Jonah had to learn that was that he, that is Jonah, uh, did not deserve God's grace any more than the people of Nineveh did. Jonah did not understand in his heart that grace was something that God gives. That grace was not something that belonged to you just because you are a member of Israel or a member of the church. And uh, this happens as Jonah is thrown overboard in chapter 2 and the fish swallows him. There Jonah realizes that even his own salvation did not depend on him. He had been trying to save himself from God by fleeing, but God had been revealing to him in Jonah's own words that salvation belongs to the Lord. And so the first layer of Jonah's pride had been stripped off. And then God gives Jonah another chance in chapter 3. He says, go to Nineveh. And as he does so, he peels back another layer of Jonah's heart and he gives him another chance to be his hand of grace to the city. And so as someone who had experienced God's grace firsthand, Jonah now goes and he preaches to this great and evil city of Nineveh and the whole city repents. There's this mass revival and the whole city from the greatest to the least turns from their sin and turns to God. And again, Jonah is left with the message, with the lesson, God is in control. He will save whom he will save. And then we get to chapter 4, and instead of being happy, instead of being joyous at this mass revival, Jonah is furious. He is angry that God had saved Nineveh. And so God asks Jonah a very uh, telling question. Is it right for you to be angry? And you see once again God pulling out Jonah's heart and revealing it, holding up his pride. And we saw in the message last week that actually no, Jonah was not right to be angry. Salvation does not belong to Israel. Salvation does not belong to Jonah. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And in today's passage, God gives Jonah, in a sense, his final chance in the story as he peels back the final layer of Jonah's heart pride. And as the core of Jonah's heart is exposed today, there is this wonderful opportunity for us to have our hearts exposed and changed by God. And so what is going on at the core of Jonah's heart? And how does God deal with that? How are we supposed to live in the light of that? Well, let's have a look. I'm reading from Jonah chapter one, uh, chapter 4, from verse 1. Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. He prayed to the Lord, Please, Lord, isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? 
That is why I fled to Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. And now, Lord, take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord asks, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah left the city and found a place east of it. And he made himself a shelter there and sat in its shade to see what would happen to the city. And then the Lord appointed a plant and it grew over Jonah to provide shade for his head, to rescue him from this trouble, or from his trouble. Jonah was greatly pleased with the plant. And when dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant and it withered. And as the sun was rising, God appointed a scorching east wind. The sun beat down on Jonah's head so much that he almost fainted and he wanted to die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. Then God asked Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Yes, it is right, he replied. I'm angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you cared about the plant which you did not labor over and did not grow. It appeared in the night and perished in a night. So... May I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish between their right and their left, as well as many animals. Now, The first thing we need to look at is Jonah's anger as his heart is exposed. You see, Jonah was very angry at how God had provided salvation for his enemy, and Jonah was in essence sulking like a toddler. He wanted to see Nineveh destroyed. He wanted to see the city obliterated. He did not want Nineveh to be saved. And so instead of celebrating in Nineveh, instead of helping the Ninevites worship God, instead of discipling these new converts, Jonah takes himself out of the city to a place east of it, and he makes himself a shelter to see what would happen. Jonah is, in a sense, getting his popcorn ready for the destruction show. It's like that meme you see online sometimes where he's just ready, eating his popcorn, waiting for the fire and brimstone. But Jonah doesn't realize how foolish this makes him look, how ironic his actions are, how much this little temper tantrum exposes who he really is inside. You see... We have to understand that the kind of shelter that Jonah makes for himself is specifically a booth. It's the same kind of shelter or or booth that the Israelites were meant to make for themselves during the festival of booth, during the festival of Sukkoth, which means booth. Um, Now, you have to understand the history of the context here. Way back in Leviticus, God gave instructions for Israel to celebrate this feast of booths every year. And it was at a festival that was meant to remind Israel how God had saved them out of Egypt, how he had provided for them in the desert. And unlike many of the feasts that God had instructed Israel to celebrate, which they forgot about, the Feast of Booths never fell out of favor. We have evidence all throughout the Bible that Israel kept on celebrating this uh, feast every year. And so Jonah would have been very familiar with this Feast of Booths. And there's, there's this kind of beautiful irony here. You see, God is providing salvation for Nineveh by providing for them a leader, Jonah, just like God had provided for the salvation of Israel through providing them Moses to bring them out of Israel. And Jonah's response to all of this is to build a booth, the very type of booth that was supposed to remind Israel of God's provision in salvation. And yet he does so to await the destruction of the city. Jonah looks like a fool, because he is a fool. God had accepted Nineveh's repentance, but Jonah distanced himself uh, from those that God had saved. He, even now, he had rejected God's hand, or is rejecting God's hand in saving Nineveh. Even now, he refuses to be part of God's rescue plan. And we have to remember what Jonah was missing out on. Jonah had every Christian's dream job. You see, he could have spent the rest of his life fruitfully helping thousands upon thousands of people worship God, mentoring them, guiding them, helping shape their view of God and his grace and his love. He had a kind of Billy Graham opportunity here. 
and yet he blew it because he didn't fit uh, because he, um, because he didn't fit sorry it didn't fit the pattern that he expected from God it didn't work the way God expected it he expected God to be working and so instead of being in the city helping these new believers he sat outside of the city feeling sorry for himself he could have been a participant but he became a spectator he could have had joy and instead became bitter in his small and restricted view of God that dominated his thinking. Now, friends, we mustn't be too hard on poor Jonah. I can understand Jonah's decision, his choice to distance himself. Distancing yourself from all of that makes so much sense in many ways. It keeps you safe. It keeps you in control. It puts you in the driver's seat. It puts you in the judgment seat. When you sit outside of a situation as a spectator looking in, it's very easy to reduce the people you are seeing to very simplistic concepts. Distance affords you the opportunity to critique and criticize from the outside. Distance makes sense because you don't need to get dirty with filthy sinners. You don't have to worry about dealing with their problems or helping carry the weaker believer's burdens. You can consume and not contribute. And when things don't go your way, it's much easier to just go and get the popcorn ready to watch the city burn. Distance is easy. Distance gives us the opportunity to critique without cost, to break down without having to build back up. You go, our third, is a bit like that. His brothers can spend huge amounts of time building these elaborate constructions out of blocks and things, but all Hugo wants to do is to smash them down. Uh, it's much easier for him to break them down than to build them up because he didn't build them. And he doesn't understand why his brothers get so upset when the old towers fall down. Distance makes sense. It allows us to stick to our own kind, to people who think like us and look like us and smell like us but it leaves us free to stay stagnant because we never have to compromise we never have to learn to be gracious to others because there's nothing to be gracious about everyone agrees with me and distance makes sense because it's convenient it doesn't cost you anything it means we can see others as simplistic beings without nuance or complexity to reduce them to that evil Ninevite without remembering that that Ninevite has feelings and thoughts a family a wife a husband a child and is just trying to honor God to the best of their ability and distance keeps us clean it keeps us in company with people who think like us and look like us and distance is convenient and distance is cheap and Jonah chose distance because he still even after everything did not understand God's heart for dirty sinners he did not understand that God was in the business of saving people that he had been on a mission of saving the world ever since sin came into the world Distance made sense to Jonah, but it does not make sense to God. And my dear friends, is it not good that God does not think like Jonah? He chose to come to us in a person. He chose to come close. Distance keeps us clean, but Jesus came close and he ate and drank with dirty sinners. Distance keeps us in company with people who think like us, but Jesus came close and taught people who were broken and changed their thinking and made them fishers of men. Distance is convenient, but Jesus came close and suffered bodily from the day of his birth, even giving up his glory for our sake. And distance is cheap, but Jesus came close to us, took on our sin and died the most costly death suffering the full wrath of God as he paid for our sin. Distance makes sense for the world, but distance does not make sense for God. And distance is totally incompatible with his people. So how far away are you? Does your faith in God keep you clean and comfortable or convenient? Or 
like Jesus, the one whom we follow, does our faith drive us to get our hands dirty, to suffer for our brother and sister, to carry them, to cost our time and money and patience and grace? Because you see, Jesus came close and made his booth with us. And this is something that Jonah did not understand. And so God gives him another chance. And he teaches him through this second question, should you be angry about the plant? From verse 6, he says, Then the Lord appointed a plant and it grew over Jonah to provide shade for his head and to rescue him from his trouble. And Jonah was greatly pleased with the plant. And when the dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant and it withered. And as the sun was rising, God appointed a scorching east wind. And the sun beat down on Jonah's head so much that he almost fainted. And he said, it's better for me to die than to live. And then God asked Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Yes, it is right. I'm angry enough to die. What a foolish man. So God gives this quick growing plant to give Jonah extra shade. And Jonah is exceedingly happy at the plant. And then this plant gets eaten by a worm, also sent by God, and then scorched by the wind, which was also appointed by God. And all of this happens so that God could directly address what was going on in Jonah's heart. Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Yes, says Jonah, angry enough to die. He still doesn't get it. He'd been saved by God from a watery death, which he seems to have forgotten. And he had seen how God graciously saved Nineveh, which he seems to have forgotten. He knows that God abounds in love and grace, but he still wants to stand in God's place and restrict that to the people he approves of. He doesn't want to share it with those outside the circle. And in asking this question, Jonah God is showing Jonah that he does not have the right to be angry about the plant because he did not plant the plant. He did not cause it to grow. He did not water it. Nineveh was full of people whom he did not plant and did not grow and did not water. He has no right to be angry about the plant and he has no right to be angry about Nineveh. They don't belong to him. Nineveh isn't his. Just like the plant isn't his and the worm isn't his and the scorching wind isn't his. Israel is not his and God's grace and love does not belong to him either. But because Jonah has in his heart put himself in God's place, Jonah really believes in his heart that he owns it all. That it is all his. And so when someone like God does something to his city, to his plant, because Jonah believes that he's God, he, has, he thinks he has absolute right to be angry, anger enough to die. But do you see how foolish it is, my friends? The whole point of verse 6 to 9 is that God is the one who appoints. God is the one who sends. God is the one who throws storms and sends wind. He is sovereignly in control. Jonah chapter 4 shows us that a self-centered person, a person who has put themselves in God's place, a person who who puts the whole world through the lenses of their own eyes and what they want in life, that person becomes increasingly ridiculous and petty. And they become twisted in their bitterness and resentment. And that bitterness totally erodes away spiritual life. It eats you up like the worm ate the plant. And it weakens your spiritual life. At the start of the chapter, we saw how Jonah wanted to die because God did not conform to his narrow view of salvation. Now Jonah wanted to die because of a plant. A plant. A plant which he did not plant, he did not water, he did not grow. Can you see how ridiculous that is? But that's what happens when we are consumed by our own problems. The more inwardly we focus, the more we dealt well on our own outlook, the more our spiritual lives will shrivel. Bitterness and resentment will eat us up. 
just like it did for Jonah. All it took was one worm and it killed him. His own spiritual life died when things that he had no control over did not go his way. Trivial things, little nothing things. My friends, is this a lesson we need to relearn? Is this a lesson I need to relearn? Is this a lesson you need to relearn? The lesson is this. Unless our hearts are consumed by what glorifies God, unless our hearts are again grasped by the urgent need for the gospel to go out into the world, unless we plant ourselves again in service to the Ninevites of this world, our spiritual lives will shrivel like that of the plant. And we will turn increasingly bitter and twisted, just like Jonah. Don't waste your gifts. Don't waste your calling. Don't waste that precious deposit of faith that God has given you in Christ Jesus. Shall I be bold? Shall I be brave? Shall I say what needs to be said to myself and my own withering soul worm and to yours? If you are a believer, what is true of the plant and the worm and the scorching wind is true of us. It all belongs to God. It is his to do with as he pleases, to direct as he sees fit. You and I belong not to ourselves but to him. This church belongs to him, not to us. It is his, not mine, not yours, it is his. Is it right for us to be angry? Because things did not go our way. What does our catechism say? In the very first question, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Saviour, Jesus Christ. I don't belong to me. You don't belong to you. We belong to the Lord. Jonah did not get this. In a way, he couldn't because he did not have the light of Christ. But even in the light of Christ, I think sometimes we forget that too. So how do we change? How do we change? How do we have this last layer of our onion hearts too peeled back and revealed by God? What does God do? He asks Jonah a third devastating question. Then God asked Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Yes, he says, I'm angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You cared about the plant which you did not labour over and did not grow. It appeared in the night and perished in the night. So may I not care, here's the question, may I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish between their right and their left, as well as many animals. God asks this final devastating question that needs to be asked of us. You see, he deals with the core problem in Jonah's heart through asking him this question. After stripping away every layer of his onion heart, where does God go? What does he do? He says, may I not care about this city and its people. God's cure for a bitter and twisted heart is to lift up Jonah's eyes from his own petty problems. Do you see where Jonah point, uh, God points Jonah? What is he making him look at? He says, look at this city. Look at these people who do not know right from left. He points to his mission in the world, to the bigger picture. He lifts up Jonah's eyes from his own self-interest, from his own navel-gazing, and he confronts him with what is really going on. He points out that Jonah's heart is not aligned to God's mission in the world. And God's cure for bitterness is to lift up our eyes to see his mission. You see, Jonah has been concerned with his own vision for what God ought to be doing. 
He has been occupied by his own wants. He has been consumed by his own preferences for God's plans and purposes. He wanted uh, God his way. He wanted Israel his way. He wanted salvation his way. But God has been on a mission. And now God deals this devastating blow to Jonah's pride. May I not care for Nineveh and her animals. From kings to cows, they are all mine. May I not care for them, Jonah? Do you see, friends, God is saying to Jonah, you are not me. Jonah is not God. Jonah doesn't get to set the agenda. Jonah doesn't get to call the shots. And yet after all the ways that Jonah has gone wrong, God is still inviting them. He says, uh, he is essentially saying, join God in his salvation plan. He's being invited to realign his heart to God's heart. And just like in the story of the prodigal son where we don't know what happened to the older brother, here we don't know how Jonah responds to God's question. We never actually get to see whether Jonah truly starts walking with God, pursuing the salvation of the world. We don't know about Jonah, but we get to make the decision about ourselves. We can respond to this invitation God offers us. You see, God is in the business of saving people. Not through sending Jonah, but through sending Jesus who comes and tabernacles. He comes and makes his booth with us as one who delivers God's people. He gets dirty and eventually takes on the dirt of all of our sin. He chooses closeness to live among broken people so that we can be saved. And he invites us this morning to join him in that mission. Friends, will we go? We said this morning that overwhelmingly our church community has said, yes, we are going to be joining him on that mission. That we will align our hearts to be the agents of change in this world as we focus on discipling people, as we share Jesus' story to the people we meet. And as they come to faith in him, we're going to walk with them in their dirt and their brokenness and their hurts and their pains as we share one another's burdens and carry each other into maturity. As a church congregation, that is where we are going. Do you want to come? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you expose our hearts, that you help us to see your heart for mission, your heart to save this world that you have created which we have broken, Lord, but which you are calling us into a a role of putting back together and restoring with your shalom peace. And so we pray. We pray, Lord, that you help us lift our eyes from our own navels and into the work that you are already doing. Lord, make us part of that, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen.